well, uh, I hope that everybody's doing a great, uh, having a great day today. It's getting ready to be Easter. It's Easter. It is Easter weekend. Um, I taught this lesson uh, a couple. Uh, I guess it was not last Wednesday, Wednesday but the week before, and I uh, didn't get to launch search right. I had to re-record it. So, okay. Um, Lord, I just pray that you'd give us uh, attitudes, words, and a heart that honors you. Um, when you are, uh, let me see if I can scroll here. Um, the uh, at the church that I um, am at, there's three pastors, myself and two others, and uh, we're currently dealing, dealing with an issue where we are we're completely unsure of exactly what to do, and we keep going back with maybe we should do this or maybe this, and the biggest reason is because we care for the church, and but we also care for the false teachers and the false leaders that come into the church. There was a time when the choices were easier because we didn't care about well any of the church, at least myself. I, am, I can't speak for the other two pastors, but it was a lot easier to take care of stuff when you didn't care. Um, you know, hey, if people are stupid enough to be misled by false by false teachers, that's their problem. Or, uh, you know, hey, uh, if, you know, uh, if somebody's a false teacher, uh, just to hell with them. And I certainly didn't care about people who came in and took advantage of churches. But with time, I've changed. Um, it, it doesn't please God to destroy the wicked. And I desire greatly to see this church, the church I'm at, prosper. And I, and I desire to see people change. And it's not just my church either. I, I want to see the, the American church, the Western church, really get back on course. Um, you know, it was kind of sabotaged by the Republicans, and then it was sabotaged by the Democrats. And the church has to be an entity that exists beyond those two. It has to be something that exists by God's standards, not not by liberal or conservative standards. And I know we've kind of we enjoy playing politics and social warrior and all this stuff and calling the stupid Democrats and stuff. And it's like, okay, that's not really helpful, you know, all those stupid dumb Republicans. And it's like it's just not helpful. Um, so uh, just gonna be talking a little bit about leading. And uh, leading is very important. We all do it. It's just something that we, I think we all kind of have to have an, an idea of what's going on. Um, so to be more specific, the situation that's going on at uh, our church, um, part of it at least, I should say, there's, there's, there's more. But so this, these, uh, th this, this couple came in that is very much so false. I mean, they're, they're false leaders or false, false teachers. And what I mean by that is. Really, the biblical definition—they're—they're they're in it for their own, uh, for their own gain. They um, do not believe that Jesus is God. They—they um, they are very vehement about that. Um, the wife gave a false prophecy, um, and just a bunch of different stuff. And it's a very stressful situation. We do go to a church where we allow for the gifts of the Spirit, um, and I know everybody has a different opinion on that. But what, this cannot be denied. This is what happened. Okay. A Sunday night came, and it was just this overwhelming, uh, crushing sense of, of terror. Um, and God gave them a word that was very uh, rough, <laughs> um, you know, about him judging them and stuff. And it was like three or four other people um, also gave the same thing. So there was about a total of like four to six people that gave a word. And then the next week they came again, and the same thing happened. Except the first week, I, I was just I was just lying on the ground covering my head. It was a very terrifying experience. Um, you can you can believe whatever you want about the gifts of the spirit, but it, there was no doubt that God was very much in that place and speaking. And the second week, He gave an even stronger uh, warning, and it was just extremely terrifying. It kept going for two hours. We. We, there was no sermon. It was just two hours of just sheer terror. And in the midst of this, um, she gave a word that was completely contrary to what was what was being said by all the other people. And you know, obviously, a true prophet can say something that the majority of people are not saying. I'll give you an example of that: was all those false prophets that were saying, "Oh, Trump will be president. Trump is the Messiah." All this nonsense. 
And uh, n nope, God never said that Trump would that Trump would have a second term. And then uh, I remember very strongly God told me that Biden would win the presidency. And so here we are. And you know the false prophets, although there were a bunch of them, uh, they were wrong. And the the minority of prophets were, were were true. But this time it was the exact opposite. Like everybody was was, was humble about it. Everybody was just like. Uh, you know, taking a step back and just completely surrendering themselves, and it was just, it was, it was, it's hard to even put towards what happened, you know. And then these two people were just really arrogant. Uh, the wife had this snide look on her face, this whole, you know, scoffing attitude and everything. It was just a very terrifying thing. Um, you think, oh, when God, you know, gives somebody a break or a warning that, you know, hey, they'll listen or whatever, this is not what happened in this case. So, that's the situation, and I bring that up because we're going to be talking about it. It has something to do with what we're talking about. So there's two lead two principles of leadership. The first one is that everyone is a leader, and everyone is an example. Um, either you're a leader in your home or your job or your ministry. Whatever, you are a leader. You are an example. Um, obviously, there's different, there's different degrees of leadership, and there's different positions. But just because you don't have a position doesn't mean you, you are a leader. And just because you do have a position, position doesn't mean you aren't a leader. And then the second principle is that everyone who leads well must be led. Oh, well, I don't, I, I don't want to be led. Here's the thing. Everybody's led by something. Maybe you're led by your feelings or desires. Maybe you're led by a false leader um, that has trained you, uh, false doctrine, that kind of stuff. Everybody's led by something. Um, and so, like, for instance, at our church, it's the church is led by the pastor who's led by the district. We have a very clear line of authority. If you are submitted to God, you will submit to his authority structure. That's just the way it is. Some some, some board members try to, like, just take over a church, and that's, that's not good leadership. It's not working together. Um, so, yeah. Um, if you read in the book of the law, not submitting to Moses was not submitting to God because Moses was appointed by God. It was his idea. Um, I'm going to read uh, real quick Matthew chapter 8. Um, hold on just a minute. Matthew. Eventually I will get there. Okay, read Matthew. Come on. I'll get there eventually. Matthew 8, starting in verse 5, going through verse 10. When he entered Capernaum, this is talking about Jesus, a centurion came to him pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. He said to him, Am I to come and heal him? Lord, the centurion replied, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, my servant will be healed, for I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my servant, Do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great, so great a faith. And the point I want to make is that faith, in this case, was submitting to authority. Not some feeling that they puffed up in themselves or merely a strong sense of self-confidence or anything like that. It was submitting to authority. Um, so there are levels of leadership. Uh, the lowest is, is a poor leadership. It's... it's um, it's more of like a no leadership, but remember, everybody's a leader. <laughs> so um, maybe if they have a position, it's not one that they really deserve. Um, it's it's a very low level uh, leadership. You're doing it poorly. Um, first off, at this stage, you're talking about people. You're taking sides in conflict. At this stage, you're not under authority, but you usually want to dominate others. You want everybody to just be enamored with you. Um, the attention always has to be on you. You typically focus on things like charisma to try and win people over. Um, conversations revolve around conspiracy theories and rants and unfounded beliefs. And you might say, well, what do you mean by unfounded beliefs? Well, I'll name a couple and you'll know what I'm saying. Uh, there, there are some who believe that there was a world in between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. This world was uh, destroyed or whatever. We don't really know. You can't. It's just all supposition. But the problem is that in, in the Hebrew, the way that the Hebrew sentence is constructed, um, it is a... Uh, it, it, it's, it's very clear that verse 2 is a continuation of verse 1. It's not um, something that is it can be separated and isolated. Um, another good example would be uh, Bethel Church's grave soaking. The idea of this is that they go and lie on top of people's graves and supposedly they, they, they absorb the mantle or whatever. Um, it's kind of a really, really creepy thing going on there, but uh, a good example of an unfounded belief. Well, it could, you could do that, but it's like, but hold on, we're, nowhere in the Bible is the, our Christians commanded to do that, regardless of whether or not you could even do that. <laughs> um, another one is, a lot of people believe that there are hidden words of blessings 
um, in the Old Testament. Uh, that not, uh, now here's here's the here's the funny thing is that neither Jews nor the early church knew anything about these supposed you know power words or secret secret things. Um, a real big popular one is the word the Hebrew word shalom, um, and, and they use this kind of like a spoken blessing. Like all you have to do is utter the word shalom over over somebody, shalom to you, and it supposedly means wholeness or completeness to you. And I understand what they're trying to get at, but that's not really the way that language really works. Um, shalom means it can really have a lot of different meanings. Like especially the, in the older languages, they really have a um, a very wide uh, uh, semantic range in a word. Um, you see this with the development of writing. Um, you know, one mark could mean like a letter or, or a word or uh, a completely unrelated word. Um, it's just a whole real complicated concept. And when you say stupid things like, hey, um, this old dead language, I'm going to just utter one of its words and it's going to somehow conjure a special blessing, that's just not really how things work. Um, <clears throat> so let's just kind of run run through this. First off, w words really do have many meanings depending on their context, and that's how you translate words too. Let's say you're translating the Bible and you come to a word, and you really have to pay attention to what is the context that the word is being used in, and that will help you understand what the word itself means. Uh, but then there's a deeper issue here: is that Hebrew is not a heaven language. It's a literal human language. We see um, historically when it was really be when it really developed into its own. I guess is a way of saying that, and then when it kind of died out. Um, so if there was some heavenly power words that could conjure these blessings uh, onto people, uh, how? Why would you have to say it in Hebrew? What makes Hebrew so special? Why couldn't you just say peace and wholeness to you? See what I mean? Um, and then there's kind of a whole other idea. In, in older languages, words were less specific, and they stood more for concepts more than our language does. Now, I'm not saying – it's a hard way to explain this, but it's, it was more of a conceptual language more than a literal language. Um, our language works like differently. Like, here, let me give you a good example of this. Um, in the book of Exodus, it says that the Israelites built store cities, but – that, that, that is a very literal translation, a store city. But the problem is, is that Israelites didn't really think like that. A store city could be any kind of a walled building. It could technically kind of be a shed. It could be a warehouse. It could actually be a city. Um, you really don't know. It's it's not something that's so cut and dry, you know. And that's just not really how ancient languages worked. They, they did have a... a they just weren't as precise as English is today. Let's just leave it at that. So, so shalom can mean peace, absolutely. It can mean completeness. Here's a good example. In Jeremiah, I believe it's 13, 19, it says that um, all of Judah will be carried into exile, the whole number of them, Judah entirely. That word translated entire, all of them, uh, is shalom. It, it means completely, the complete number of Judah will be carried into exile. Now, obviously, in that context, it doesn't mean peace and it doesn't mean wholeness. So that's something to watch out for. Um, another good good example is, is Abba. Uh, people take this and they and they then say, okay, it's it's Daddy. You know, we we should refer to God as Daddy. And really, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, besides the disrespectful aspect of, of of that, which I guess is might be uh, just up to a certain person's you know um, personal opinion, but. I, I'm continually surprised by how many people say these things about how a language works when they have no idea about the language itself. Um, Abba does not really mean daddy. It, it doesn't. It, it would, no. It would be more like the modern day equivalent of calling uh, God father, my father, not my daddy. It, there's a whole sexual idea going on there, which is kind of creepy. And then there's, you know. It's debatable whether that's respectful, but then also there's a whole age appropriateness, um, and there's just a lot of different things there. And long story short, Abba does not mean daddy, so maybe that should be something that isn't really. And that's kind of what I'm talking about, unfounded beliefs. At, at a poor leadership position, you you are always talking about this kind of stuff. You, you don't really have – you don't really have any – it's kind of like a free-for-all with beliefs. Um, and at this stage, it's very common to complain about being mistreated. Oh, nobody understands me. You know, uh, you know, complaining about the job that you do or the ministry you do. You're you're underappreciated. Uh, you're so abused. Um, 
uh, oftentimes you talk about uh, how in America things are, people are, Christians are so abused, and it's like, well, that's not really how it works, but okay, all right, that's fine. Um, so then that takes us to low leadership. This is this is the next step up from poor leadership. Uh, it's it's you This is a good place to be in because you're growing. Um, at, at this level of leadership, you're talking about ideas um, rather than people. You're under authority. You're teachable. You, you're you're working towards being a lifelong learner. You're encouraging people, but not the sin. Um, so like, okay, uh, instead of oh girlfriend, yeah, you 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 get that divorce. Instead of that, you know, encouraging the poor person without condoning the sin. And this is really hard nowadays because. Oftentimes, our culture makes it out to be where the two have to be one and the same. You either have to hate gays, for instance, or you have to be condoning of the homosexual lifestyle. There's no in-between. It's like, well, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, well, anyways. Um, <clears throat> at this stage, you're having conversations about good things. Your speech is directed. You're not just talking to hear yourself speak. So don't just assume... Um, you are not just assuming that you are right, um, but you're also not easily misled. Like, it, 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 it's, it's two extremes there. Sometimes when people have, when people respect their authority, sometimes they go to the opposite extreme and stop thinking, and they become easily misled. Um, you know, um, yes, men. But then at the other side, it's just something you have to watch out for, and I'll just leave it with that. Um, so, what would be good things that you could uh, that, that your conversations would revolve around? Well, things like how God has blessed you, or stuff like that. Not how irritated you are about politics or conspiracy theories about the election and that kind of nonsense. Um, so then there's high leadership. This is this is a place that we all aspire to be. Hopefully, it's where all pastors are. I know that that's not really realistic, but it would be nice if that's where all pastors were. Um, at this stage, you're equipping others to do ministry, not just doing it all yourself, not just di uh, giving commands, but you're equipping others to do the ministry, to replace you, that kind of stuff. Um, and you're equipping others even if it costs you. And how could, it, how could it cost you? It could cost you time. It could cost you people looking down on you for training undesirables. It could cost you um, for not getting anything in return. Um, at this stage, you're making peace rather than winning arguments. So you get an argument with somebody and – or somebody tries to get an argument. Instead of focusing on winning the argument, you're focusing on bringing peace to the situation. So uh, making peace as a leader is not overlooking the power hungry, and it's not uh, – Overlooking people who give false prophecies. You you have to take care of that kind of stuff as a leader. Um, if you don't, all you're doing is postponing the inevitable conflict that will come. And dealing with it brings peace. Sometimes you bring peace by overlooking offenses. Sometimes you bring peace by directly dealing with it so as to prevent it happening in, in the future. Um, at this stage, you're doing things you don't necessarily like for the good of others. So what's some good examples of that? Well, giving a word that may be hard because it's true rather than saying what you want or what will make others happy um, with you. Um, so like if, 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 uh, you're, if be, you're being used by God to give a word of prophecy, instead of giving something that will earn you people um, liking you, something that God actually told you to say. Now obviously saying it with the right attitude, duh, but obviously there has to be a, a, a line there somewhere too. Another good example is, is um, I am not really – I'm not pastor material. I'm, I'm not good at pastoring. I'm not patient with people like I should be. I'm just, I'm just not really a pastor. And, um, but I serve as a pastor at my church, um, which is something that I don't necessarily like, and I'm not really necessarily good at it, but I do it for the good of others. And what I mean by that? Well, to try and encourage people, to try and give direction, to try and help the, the senior pastor to accomplish his goal. Um, it's not all about me. Um, so uh, at this stage, you're not just refraining from, but you're stopping gossip and complaint. So maybe at a lower le leadership, you would just refrain from gossiping. You would just keep your peace and keep your mouth shut and uh, don't show on your face that you're agreeing with the person. But at a higher leadership, you just put an end to that. No, we don't do that. Now, the problem with authority is oftentimes when we get, when we get authority, excuse me, we think that we are no longer under authority. And... So that brings us to another very interesting point. Even when you get authority, you never get to a point of being over the pastor. He is still the pastor of the church. It's like when you have a, have a job and your boss gives you a promotion. That doesn't mean you're over the boss. Um, some people act apart to get authority or a position 
as a means to their end. So um, basically, they just wanted position. They just wanted uh, authority. But then other people... Um, so basically, another way we're saying that is that they serve and love people to get position rather than getting position to love and serve people. So some people, as soon as they get authority, believe that they no longer have to be under authority. And that's just really what we're talking about. That's not true. Um, and you're in for a world of hurt. You have to learn how to be under authority no matter how high up in authority you are. So that takes us to what's called the triangle of, uh, of leadership. The idea is this, that the higher position you get, the more responsibilities you have. Like you have to clean up after yourself. You have to uh, stay faithful in attendance, that kind of stuff. Um, and But then the more position, the higher position you get, the more responsibilities you get, the fewer personal rights you have. So a personal right would be like drinking. Here at our church, we don't drink because of how it will affect others. And that's something that we always watch out for. The leadership at this church, regardless of whether you think drinking is right or wrong, the leadership at our church does not drink um, because of how it will affect others. We do with a lot of um, alcoholics. Um, now, I also don't drink because I have a family history that I really need to watch out for, but that's, uh, I guess, uh, apart from the, the discussion. Um, another personal right is not having things your way all the time. Uh, another personal right is not putting stupid stuff on your Facebook, censoring what you post. Um, so the higher position you go, the fewer rights and more responsibilities you will have. Um, what, the problem is that people want to be at the top of the triangle. They want to be in charge of everybody else, but they don't want to have responsibilities and they don't want to give up their rights. They don't want to grow character. They want to, they want to be at the top but maintain the character of being at the bottom. So whenever the, we talk about these kinds of things, there's, there's two kinds of things that, that come up. The first, um, the first attitude is this. I could do such a better job than them, um, whoever them is. The, the pastor or whoever's in charge of that ministry that you think you could do a better job or whatever. So let me just say this. You couldn't. Um, you know, back before I did was a pastor, I was like, oh, well, it couldn't be that hard. And then I became a associate pastor, and I thought, man, this is really hard. And then the senior pastor said, man, it's it's so much harder being a senior pastor than an associate pastor. And I was just thinking, you mean it gets worse? It gets harder? What? Um, so don't don't think don't just assume that you could do a better job because you aren't there. Um, if God brought you to that position, then it would be your job to do it. But God brought that other person there, and so you need to. Uh, learn how to be, to be a good second seat. Um, but another attitude that we can sometimes have is they're just so lucky to have me. And so we start doing an inferior job on stuff because, hey, no, they, they can't find anyone else to do it. You know, I'm just, I'm just such a good person. Um, and with this, I need to say a few other things. The first is that you cannot gain a position by encroaching on someone else's position. So basically, well, I want to be in charge of... Pick something. I don't know. Maybe your church has a food pantry or uh, a Sunday school or whatever. Um, and so you try and get a position by encroaching on them. You start gossiping and badmouthing them. You start trying to uh, over dominate them, try to tell them how to do everything. You cannot gain a position by encroaching on someone else's position. You have to commit to the mission and the purpose, even if it offends you, or you have to change. Um, for instance, at, at our church, uh, um, our, our mission is building bridges in the community, and bringing people to God. Those are the two the two things that we're about. Everything that we do is for that purpose. We have a food pantry. Why? To build, to build bridges in the community and bring people to God. That's why we do it. It's not to give, it's not to give food out. Um, but one of the organization that we work with is called um, Roadrunner Food, food uh, Road, Roadrunner Food Bank or something like that. Anyways, they have a rule that you can't pray for people unless they ask for prayer. Now, that might be hard for some, but we are under authority, and I understand that. So it, that offends us, but we are willing to overlook our offense for the mission. And that's what I'm talking about. You have to commit to the mission and purpose, even if it offends you, and even if you have to change, and even if you have to stop doing things. Um, so it's just some real quick um, leadership lessons. And obviously, I we, we could talk about things like uh, how to avoid burnout as a leader um, and those kinds of things. But um, suffice it with these three things. First off, success in leadership is not how others respond. It's how well you love God and obey. I'm sorry, it's how well you love people and obey God. Did you, did you obey what God told you to do? And did you love people while you were doing it? That's it. If they don't respond well, if it didn't work out how you wanted to, that, that doesn't make you a failure or success in leadership. 
other people are not how other people respond is not your uh, your standard of, of, of success how do you say whether or not you had a win in your leadership how do you know if you if you accomplish what you set out to do by whether or not you did what God told you to do and whether or not you love people are you doing it you hear a lot of people call themselves prophets, but they don't have any love for the people. They say these these things, and maybe they're right in what they say. I don't know, but they have this real hateful attitude with it. So you will mess up. That is something that, that you will do. Um, you will definitely mess up. Just because um, there's a standard for leadership doesn't mean that you will always live by it all the time and never have a failure. I mean, have you ever been a parent? You have these ideas and these dreams, and you don't really meet them. That doesn't mean that you're a bad parent. It just means that you're a human. Um, obviously, if you're in a, a lifestyle of not reaching these um, these levels of, of leadership, that's obviously a problem. So, um, so with these leadership tiers of leadership, let's just call them that, ask yourself these two basic questions. Where do you fit, and where do those you hang around with fit? You, became, you become like those you hang around with, and sometimes you attract people into your life that have similar attitude problems as you. So these are both things you need to keep an eye on. So whenever we're talking about leadership, you always have to talk about fake leaders. Um, the thing about fake leaders is they look and act the part. They don't always have positions, but they try and get authority behind without the position. They try and do it by closed door, through closed doors. So they look and act the part. You like to like them. Um, you might have a, war a warning in your conscience at first, but you ignore it because, well, they're, it, it's hard to spot you know, these people, and they're super friendly. Um, oftentimes, they're very charismatic, and it's just something where it's, oh, man, this is nice. Um, so how do you tell if, if you can't really tell? Well, there's a few things. First off, they'll oftentimes – not oftentimes. They will teach a different gospel. Um, maybe Jesus isn't fully God, or maybe the maybe we are elevated to the place of God. Um, a good example of this would be that we can decree things in prayer because we are so powerful. It stops being about Jesus, and it just starts being about us. Jesus was only made uh, what he was through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can do greater things than him, uh, greater works than him. And it's like, well, no, no, that's that's false. Here's the thing. Jesus, you hear people saying this all the time, especially in the real overly charismatic false doctrine camps. Um, and I'm not saying to be Pentecostal is to be a heretic, but... There are definitely a lot of groups in Pentecostalism or Charismaticism, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they say stuff like this. Well, we can do greater works than Jesus. Here's the thing. Jesus made the whole world. And he sustains it with, the, with his power. And he said himself that no servant is greater than the master. So when you look at a passage like in John 14, 12, where it says that greater you will do greater works than these... It, greater is obviously not in, in the sense of power, but in the sense of number, since Jesus only did miracles for a very short time. But in contrast to his three, excuse me, three years of ministry, the church would go long into the future, so they would do greater works. They would do more works. Um, context is very much so important with, with um, translation. It is true that greater could mean greater in quality, instead of in quantity, but the context has to has to govern that. We will not ever be greater than the master, so we know that we have a, a misunderstanding there. Another thing that they do, uh, fake leaders do, is they're not under authority. They, they love to manipulate people, they love to be in control, but they don't, they don't really, they're not really under, under authority. So what does that look like? They have no pastor. Um, they, uh, now, let me just say this. When I'm talking about authority, I'm not talking about, don't look for a bunch of yes men to surround yourself with. That's not what I'm talking about at all. Um, but going back to them being under authority, they have no pastor. They they have to sometimes they're wanderers, or sometimes they see themselves above the pastor. That's why oftentimes board members will actually be fake leaders. They'll get into a position of power, and for some reason they're given it. I don't know why. Um, you really should. People need to prove themselves before they do something. You should know their character. There should be some kind of an accountability there. Um, don't put people in a position to try and get them to be something. Put them somewhere because they are something. See what I mean? So um, if someone teaches something biblical that they don't like, they simply ignore it. That's just how it is. They, they have no qualms with disapproving uh, of a pastor's decisions, often vocally, uh, and, cri and, and criticizing how the, a better ways that, the, that it could have been done. But... They usually don't have any mentors in their life because they see themselves as the spiritually enlightened ones. They, they are the smart ones or the spiritual ones. 
they are often in a rut, often in a very big rut, because they want to validate what they've chosen to believe rather than learn the truth. Vast sections of the Bible they ignore or turn into some fancy analogy or, or metaphor just so that you know they can make sense of it because it doesn't fit with their with their doctrines and they're not they're not willing to change. Um, they really have no correct discernment. Um, they they attract the disgruntled. Now maybe this is because they inspire dis uh, people to be disgruntled, or maybe they just um, maybe they just maybe the people were already disgruntled and so they attracted them. I don't know. Um, but they surround themselves with these um, disgruntled people who who actually have the very attitude that they have in themselves. And, you know, it's like bitter people will oftentimes surround themselves with bitter people. So, that, well, for a lot of different reasons. But a lot of the reasons, one of the big reasons why fake leaders will attack the disgruntled is because so they can minister to them, they say. They do this so that they can feel holier than them. And they surround themselves with these people so that they can feel that they're needed, so that they, you know, can fulfill some great ministry because they don't have a position. And they'll, they'll say these little cutting remarks. Sounds like he really wasn't listened to. Yeah, it sounds like the pastor, he's just a jerk. He doesn't listen to you. Um, and then you start seeing, seeing patterns. Like, here's a good example. Um, our senior pastor is, is a man of very good character. But every single time there's, um, there are women who are getting divorced, they will always say this to, uh, say this to him. They'll say that he's a manipulator. Nobody else does, only women who are getting, getting divorced. And these women, um, even if they aren't currently in the process of getting divorced, they'll be cheating on their husbands. And so then there's been people who have come by and, and have been their sympathizers. Oh yeah, the pastor, he's just, he's just this, uh, this, you know, manipulator, this womanizer. And it's like, isn't it kind of funny that these people with these bad attitudes, they all kind of flock together, that these are the only people who are saying this? See what I mean? It's just this way of attracting people, that, you know, who will validate you. Oh yeah, basically girlfriends who will tell you that you don't need to change anything because you're perfect. Uh, fake leaders will oftentimes say these little snide comments, and then they'll say something like this, oh, it's just who I am, or, oh, oh, I was just kidding, and oftentimes they'll say that they're just kidding to kind of send out feelers, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit, just to kind of see where people are at around them. Um, uh, another, another thing is, uh, th whenever they're around, they break unity um, in the church with people, that kind of stuff. Um, they undermine authority. Um, they, they say a lot of things that are unnecessary, and whenever they say these little snide comments, those snide comments break unity. Those snide comments undermine authority. Those snide comments are unnecessary. Those snide comments hurt people. Those snide comments open door to gossip. Um, and all those things are, are very, very important to keep in mind. Um, so they'll say something like this. Oh, it sounds like this. It sounds like that pastor doesn't really practice what he preaches. And they'll say these little snide comments not just to get people, um, not, not, not just to cut you down, but to see where other people stand and how far they can push, how far they can push it. So um, the fake leaders teach a different gospel. They are not under authority. They attack the disgruntled. They try to buy you. How do they buy you? Well, um, we've had lots of board members that used to go um, to our church and tried to buy us with money. Basically, as long as as long as um, you know you do what I want, I'll uh, I'll fund the church or whatever. Um, and sometimes they use acceptance or friendliness, and you just really need somebody who accepted you. Sometimes they try to use their power and influence with people um, for your good or for your harm. Uh, so basically, everything is a political game for them. Um, so whenever, whenever you're meeting somebody in the church and you're not sure about them, here's just a really good idea. What's their history? Really, the biggest uh, problems that I have had to deal with as a pastor has been people who have been in the church for a long time. It's not the druggies. It's not the homosexuals. It's not the alcoholics. Um, it's not the, it, Those people aren't the problems. It's these people who call themselves Christians who worship um, Republican, the Republican Party. They, um, they've gotten way off. It's not about Jesus anymore. Um, they're all about self-empowerment. The Holy Spirit, you know, makes me like Jesus and stuff. And they they love reading books by Bill Johnson, uh, watching Benny Hinn, these kinds of you know fake stuff. So what's their history? Wh where do they stand with false teachers like Bill Johnson or Kenneth Copeland? Where were they before they came to this church that you're at? 
what patterns do they have? Do they have a pattern like, for instance, quitting on people? Are they always in the middle of a church conflict, but somehow it wasn't their fault? Um, there was a there was a person who used to go to our church, and I really thought that we were friends, and so I, I tried my best to you know be there for them and to help them and all this stuff. And I thought, ah, it, it's not going to happen to me. This guy, you know, divorce every 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 serious relationship he's in friendship. I, and I shouldn't say relationship; we weren't dating, uh, but every serious friendship he's always had, he's always pushed people away. He's gotten a divorce or you know been close to it. Well, he. Health prevented his last divorce. Let me just say it like that. Um, he was kind of getting really sick, and so the last divorce didn't happen because he just didn't have the physical strength to do it. But anyways, um, so every every woman he, he had, he's been divorced to or would have been if it weren't for certain situations. Um, and, uh, you know, all, all his all his lifelong friends, he's pushed every single one of them away. And I, oh, no, no, it won't happen to me. We're close enough. It happened to me. And um, then he went behind my back and lied to people about what had happened, and I still don't even know what the issue was. He didn't come to me so he could fix the problem. I'm, I have no problem with admitting when I'm wrong, but uh, you know they had no they had no interest in that. And uh, I was willing to you know to make amends, to apologize, to whatever. I, you know I just didn't. It was something that a situation you can't fix, and sometimes those situations do come by. See, I I failed to take into account their history. And I'm not saying judge a, judge a person by their past or you know, that kind of stuff, but you'd have to be pretty stupid to ignore how somebody got someone somewhere. See what I mean? Um, history, past is prologue, and that's kind of important to remember. So at our church, everyone is welcome if they don't cause problems. There has to be a measure of, of who's allowed. You can't just allow a bunch of you know people who cause problems and who, you know... Um, well, they're just not nice people. This is a, you know what I mean? Like people who come in, oh, I'm a Christian, so that means I can try and take the the pastor's position, give false prophecies, say snide comments. There comes a point when you have to say you, you gotta go. You can't have, for instance, volunteers who don't do a good job and um, who are always causing problems whenever they volunteer. You have to say no. We have standards for volunteering, and this is not how it's gonna be. So everyone is welcome to our church, but they can't just go around causing problems, and some come with ulterior motives and don't love, really love people, and that's something you have to be aware of. Just because somebody calls themselves a Christian doesn't mean that they are, and sometimes people lie. This is something that – sometimes Christians are the most gullible people on the planet. Um, so let's look real quick at Jude. Um, when I first read Jude, I was like, this book really doesn't have much to offer. And, uh, well, I obviously I was wrong to – Excuse me, and uh, it's actually quoted, and I believe it's in Peter chapter two, the whole the whole chapter is it. But it says this: For some people who were designated designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth; they are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. So the first thing that I want to point out is they deny Jesus. They say stuff like, "Oh, he wasn't really sinless; it was the Holy Spirit that made him so." Well, then he isn't really God. Um, another thing it keeps it goes on to say now I want to remind you although you came to know all these things once and for all that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe and the angels who did not keep their own positions but abandoned their proper dwellings he has kept in eternal changing chains and deep darkness for the judgment on the great day likewise Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed sexual immorality and perversions and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire in the same way these people were lying on their dreams so here's another another Thing about these false people they rely on their dreams it's their special revelation even over the bible bill johnson for instance talks about um he, he talks and i'll paraphrase he, he talks about um well what i think that the holy spirit is saying can trump and contradict what the holy spirit actually did say in the bible and uh, he doesn't say it exactly like that but he does teach that idea um they say stuff like, well, the Bible was a lesser revelation, but now the Holy Spirit has been given to us, so we get a deeper revelation. We have to go back and reinterpret the Bible to fit what I believe God is like rather than what he actually said he is like in the Bible. So their dreams, their own special revelation. Um, and so they defile the flesh, reject authority, and slander glorious ones. So then the next thing is that they reject authority. Um, 
uh, they want to be their own boss and decide the church's direction. They want to twist what you said, and they will. Oh, well, the pastor said this. It's, no, that's that's not really true. I once taught, for instance, that you, should hang around, you shouldn't hang around with people who, who uh, leave the church on bad terms or who are asked to leave because, um, well, the Bible tells us not to associate with people who call themselves Christians but cause a problem and go from church to church causing problems. Um, uh, but... Um, So I, I taught that, that you shouldn't hang around with people who cause problems and, and then left or were kicked out of the church because, one, you will validate them and their bad attitudes, and two, you will learn their bad attitudes and start acting like they did. Um, and then somebody used that. Um, basically, long story short, I don't want to get too into it, but they misquoted me and used it for used it as an excuse for this really just kind of lo poor thing that they did. And... Uh, or going back to that uh, example that I gave at the beginning, or that story that I told at the beginning, uh, two weeks in a row, Sunday nights, where, where God was giving warning messages to these two spe people specifically, and the terror of God was very much so in that service. And then the 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 one of them, the second week, uh, you know, gave that false uh, prophecy um, high-handedly too. It was very obvious. Um, it, there's just this feeling of dread, and for the first time in my entire life, God actually had me interrupt their word and say, "This was not my word," and then give a word, a word war warning her for what she had, or I don't even know, punishing her. I don't know, whatever it was. It was a very, very, very scary situation. God has never had me do that before, and I've never even heard of that happening before. We don't make a we don't make a habit of of embarrassing people in our church. Um, but the word said basically after after the after for two weeks God said you know the I, I'm bringing judgment on you and then the, this person said oh well there's nothing to fear and that's exactly the opposite of what God had said um, <clears throat> it was just a very scary situation but they reject authority um, and so in that example you know the the authority of the church the authority of the leadership um, the authority of God they rejected all of that and instead. Uh, you know, substitute it for their own reality. And uh, so reading on in, in, in Jude, Yet when Michael the archangel was disputing with the devil in an argument about Moses' body, he did not dare utter a slanderous condemnation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme any, anything they do not understand. And with that, they do under... They, and what they do understand by instinct, like irrational animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, have plunged into Balaam's error. Now, now what's that? Well, Balaam is this false prophet um, that was asked by a king to curse Israel. But God had already said in his word that um, he would bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. And also it says that um, he was finding out God's will by divination when God specifically told him not to. Um, and then he kept asking God again on something he, God had already revealed in the Bible. And it's like just complete lack of that. And then after all those things... Um, Balaam incited the the, uh, the king's people to go and have sex with with um, Israel and have them worship their gods, and so that's what they did, and, and, and he was actually uh, killed for it um, in the end anyways. Um, so Balaam's error for profit, um, so Balaam's error was that he was greedy for profit and self-gain. Um, and have perished uh, for Kor in Korah's rebellion. Now, so that takes us to who's Korah? Well, in the book of Numbers, there's this guy um, who's a Levite, Korah. He wanted Moses' position, and so he incited a rebellion against the pastor, uh, who was Moses, the pastor of Israel, uh, causing uh, causing a, a church split is, is never God's will. Let me just write there. Um, it's just never God's will. So then he gets his two friends, and uh, incites a rebellion, a rebellion against Moses. And, uh, well, I'm holy too. Let me just address that real quick. There, there was actually a woman uh, who used to go to our church. Um, and let me just emphasize this again. Inciting rebellion against a pastor and causing church splits is never God's will. So the, the, this woman uh, wanted to get a divorce from her husband because he had cheated on her, but she had cheated a bunch of times too, so it was like whatever. Now, obviously, I'm not condoning cheating, but in this case, God specifically told this woman not to get a divorce. 
and she knew. And then God sent other people by to, to encourage her not to get a divorce, and she didn't for years. But eventually she started thinking that she was better and more righteous because she didn't abandon him. So she talked herself into sleeping with a guy who she wasn't who wasn't a Christian and she was who she wasn't married to before she was even divorced. And see the thing was, even if she was better, her actions made her not. So some people say, well, I'm better than the pastor. I could do a better job. Here's the thing. I'm not I'm not that great of a pastor. I'm not that great of a person. Maybe. Maybe you are better than me. But if you start rebelling, which is as of witchcraft, and grumbling and complaining and gossiping and causing problems and sing yourself pridefully, you won't be better than me anymore. You will have disqualified yourself. Um, so then it keeps going. These people are dangerous reefs at your love feasts, as they eat, eat with you without reverence. They are shepherds who only look after themselves. They are leaders who only look after themselves or their own profit. These, these are people, uh, people to the, to this kind of a person. Let me say it like this: to these kinds of a per, kind of a person, um, people are nothing but tools that they can use, and they manipulate people for their own benefit rather than surrendering themselves and uh, serving people. It is very stressful pastoring. You always worry about the church and pray for them, teach them, pour into them. And many times, with nobody knowing what problems, pe problem people or, or situations you have to deal with, and the thankless times and the betrayals and the seemingly wasted investments, false leaders and prophets don't get that because they are in it for recognition, power. They don't suffer for people. It's about their own profit. It's about their gain. And that is really one of the big differences. They aren't willing to endure. You don't see you don't see a history of them staying at this church through thick and thin when their reputation is, is destroyed, when nobody cares about them, when they're standing by themselves. You don't see that. You see them going from situation to situation trying to, oh well do 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 and they oh well this pastor is wrong and this pastor is wrong and I'm such a hero for standing up to them. They are waterless clouds carried along by winds, trees in late autumn. Fruitless, twice dead and uprooted, they are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. It was the, about these that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, Look, the Lord comes with tens of thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and concerning all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have sent, uh, said against him. These people are discontented grumblers living according to their desires. So first off, uh, er, the next thing, grumblers. Well, I could do a better job than them. I'm so much more spiritual than them. Um, their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. And I'll read uh, another verse or two. But you, dear friends, remember that what was predicted by the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you in the end time there will be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are worldly, not having the spirit. They create divisions. And when, when, it's ta when it talks about that, you have to remember, what's the fruit of these people? I think, uh, I think of Absalom, King David's son. And how he sat at the table and said, oh, if I was king, I'd do so much. He didn't know what he was talking about. He'd never been king before. He had no idea what he was talking about. Instead, he just went and sympathized with people so that he could use them basically um, so let's look at some traits of the false first up they can't just leave and then after after a, a causing problems then they leave poorly so uh, they're unhappy they have a list of complaints of what needs to change and, and, and they just think that they just have a whole different idea of what's going on they cause disunity and somehow oh it's their fault that there's disunity um, they incite others into conflict to keep, so that they can keep their own hands clean. They say snide remarks to discredit others and then just say, oh, just kidding. Um, and, and the reason why they say that and why they do this is so that they can test the waters. Oh, it sounds like you don't practice what you preach. I was preaching a few weeks ago, and uh, I was teaching about Jesus Christ uh, being fully God. And one of those same two people audibly said in the middle of it, no, and became very irritated because he doesn't believe in the lordship of Jesus Christ. But he doesn't directly say so. And ever since, he keeps his distance and makes a big, showy thing of going up to everyone else in the room, except for me. Um, they, uh, they know everything everyone else is doing wrong, especially leaders. 
they they think that they can manipulate God through certain prayers or words, so they try to manipulate people. That their relationship with God is shown in their relationship with people. They are somehow always the heroes. They have been through so much, and they are so great for standing up to the pastor. And all that they have behind them is a is a sea of of churches that they have really impoverished. Everything they say and do is calculated, but they act naive. Oh, what? Um, they pit people against people. Here's here's an example. I was I was teaching, um. I was teaching about something. Um, uh, well, there's a lot of different examples I could give. One of the examples is I was um, teaching against um, uh, a, a common a common heresy, and um, oh, man, I don't know which story to tell. I'll, I'll tell I'll tell two. And uh, this person. Um, a couple weeks later, went to the, one of the other pastors and gave him a book by one of these people who teaches this heresy that I was talking against. See, little little calculated things, trying to pit people against each other, he, somehow thinking that they can pit one pastor another, against another. Another good example, um, I at the week after I preached that, that thing about Jesus being God, I really didn't like that. So then, excuse me, the next week when the, another pastor was, was doing a sermon, they made this big showy thing about clapping after the thing of, oh, that, that sermon was so good, and trying to make, trying to make uh, the pastors jealous of one another. And uh, doing little little things behind the, the behind closed doors like, or behind behind things uh, what's it called um, behind people's backs. Uh, another example. Um, yeah, let me think. No, I think that's enough examples. But uh, I was teaching on how there are no secret words to me to be God, um, and that prayers have no power. But it's the God who hears uh, is what gives prayer. Um, 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 you know, it's it's importance. Um, I don't know how to say that. What what makes prayer um, powerful? Um, and then uh, there was this guy who a fake leader um, went and was doing stuff behind uh, behind my back to basically teach this. Um, it's. I'm trying not to give too much exam, too many, too many details. So I think maybe I might have to just drop that example and move on. Um, but uh, you, you really have to watch out for this new movement called the New Apostolic Reformation. It, there's a lot of power-hungry people who are going going around with this. They they love Bill Johnson and they they follow the New Apostolic Reformation and they might not even know that it's called that, but that's what it is. Apostles and prophets are, 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 are rising up and, you know, we're establishing a, a new world order, a new Christian world order. And, uh, oh my goodness. And pastors and apostles, or prophets and apostles are outmoding pro, uh, pastors. And the Bible has to be reinterpreted uh, to back these things. It's just a bunch of nonsense. I mean, oh my goodness, it, I could keep going, but just watch out for this kind of stuff. Um <clears throat> so then they, uh, they they have no vested interest uh, in the church. Uh, they tear up churches. They destroy what others have built. They use others to springboard to greater prestige and honor. Um, so, for instance, they'll help in a food pantry not to build bridges in the community or bring people to God, but to play politics, to get noticed, to gain influence. And our church is a prime target because we do a lot of stuff for the community. But it's protected in a way because we are organized and we can't be bought. A lot of people can be bought. Um, they'll say stuff like, oh, that pastor's arrogant. None of these churches are doing it right. Yet they are not invested in any church, just in themselves. They think they are correctors, given secret knowledge and wisdom to go and set people straight. But it only ever results in conflicts and conflicts with authority and then moving on to the next place. And that's the, that's the fruit of it. Um, so beware. Beware of false teachers and, and false prophets. They, they will leave a mess and you will be left hanging. Trust must be earned. Learn someone's past and don't just put, you know, tr unwarranted trust in somebody or else when they cause a problem with the church, it'll be you who inherits the, pro the false prophet's uh, punishment. But, you know, I find I am a man that is greatly hypocritical. I preached a sermon a couple of Sundays ago about not worrying but praying, yet I worry greatly because there are false leaders and false prophets who are trying to devour the church 
not just the local church, but the church in, in America. And I worry. And, and Paul really did the same. I, in in um, a little bit of a brain fart. But in one of the books of Corinthians, he says about how he's constantly, I think it's 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about how he's constantly distressed about the church. And it's, it's a hard place to be in because, I mean, he's the same person who said, don't worry, but present your request to God. I survived many false leaders and prophets in the past in my church, but back then I didn't care about them. I didn't care about the false prophets. I didn't care about, care about the congregation. Leaders are called to warn people of dangers, perhaps even calling them out by name when they are non-repentant troublemakers, but we hope they will repent. Manipulators often claim repentance where there isn't, though. Um, I, I remember that um, the second week, two different people said that they really felt that they should call these two people out. And uh, still they kept trying to trying to play politics and pretend like, you know, they... Like they were innocent. It was a uh, very hard thing to go through as a pastor. It's, it's something where if you're the kind of person who just wants to see your enemy squashed... You're not really at a high leader, high tier leadership where you shouldn't be. But then when you really do care, it just just one of those things. Well, that's the end of this. Um, uh, main point being, you know, leading well and and watching out for those who don't lead well. So I hope you guys learned something and see ya.